In this video, we'll present how to compare two means that come from independent samples. So let's do this by example. Dr. Paul X. Callahan wanted to investigate if space flight might affect red blood cell mass. To do this, 14 rats were sent on a space flight. Another set of 14 rats were kept on Earth in otherwise similar conditions. The red blood cell mass um, data for those 28 rats are below. Notice that there's two completely separate groups here, um, a space rat group and a control group that's kept on Earth. There's no pairing between these two samples. Uh, one of the space rats does not directly correspond um, to one of the control rats. So we have to do independent samples since these samples truly are independent. So that's going to be a whole new set of um, test statistics and set of rules. So our research question is, does the data support the hypothesis that the true mean red blood cell mass of flight animals differs from non-flight animals? We want to test this at an alpha equals 0.05 level of significance. So our hypothesis is that the mean of the first group, the space uh, rats, equals the mean of the second group, the control rats. Um, the alternative is that, that it, they just differ, they're not equal to each other. Of course, we'd want to rearrange this um, so that we're setting it up as a difference of two means. So HO would be mu1 minus mu2 equals 0, and HA would be mu1 minus mu2 does not equal 0. So let's investigate how to calculate the test statistic for independent samples. Uh, we want to calculate the mean uh, variance and sample size for each independent sample, then use those in the formulas below to find the test statistic. We'll use Z for large samples and T for small samples. Now the Z statistic looks a little different from before, but not very different. The numerator is the same. We have a difference in me, uh, the difference in our sample means minus the hypothesized difference, which is usually zero. And we're still dividing it by the standard error, but the standard error is a little bit different. It's the square root of the variance of the first sample divided by n, plus the variance of the second sample divided by n. A um, little bit different, um, but sort of makes sense since these two samples are completely independent of each other. We should look at their variances separately, um, possibly. Now, if we have a large sample, we know that s is a good approximation for sigma, so therefore s squared would be a good approximation for sigma squared. That makes sense. So we can use just our sample standard deviations instead. Now, if we have a small sample, things get um, even trickier. Um, most of the time, in, at least if the population variances are definitely different, we can use the same test statistic, um, but it will be t instead of z, so it will follow a t distribution instead of a z distribution, but we calculate it the same way. However, if the variances are the same, we have to use a pooled variance, and we have to pool the variances um, sort of like a weighted mean based on their degrees of freedom. Um, so there's essentially four different things we have to consider. Are the population variances, well, two things we have to consider and four different combinations of them. So are the population variances the same or different? And are the sample sizes the same or different? And that's gonna change the formula slightly. So here's a table. You might wanna pause this table or take a screenshot of, of it or write it down somewhere. Um, this table isn't in your book. It just, it tells you which formula you should use in which scenario. Um, the top line here is where um, if our sample sizes are the same, for example, if both samples have a sample size of let's say 12 or 10, um, the first column shows what you would use if you have the variances the same in the population. Now, of course, you may not know for sure if the population variances are equal, but you can do tests for this, or you could have some evidence that the population variances should be equal. Um, now, the only really crazy case, I would say, would be if the population variances are different and the sample sizes are different. If that's the case, the T statistic, the test statistic, is really the same that I showed on the previous slide. However, the degrees of formula, the degrees of freedom formula is a little bit strange, um, a little bit difficult to work with. You'll just uh, plug the numbers into the formula. You might get a decimal answer if you do just round it down. So if you got 
you'd round it down to 14 and 14 would be your degrees of freedom. Um, just keep in mind that whenever you have um, equal variances, you can pool the variances. Um, you don't see that over here in the first formula because when you do pool the variances, being that you're weighting it by degrees of freedom, if both sample sizes are the same, there's no weighting necessary. It's just going to be an average and you're going to wind up right back to this formula. All right, so hopefully that wasn't too much for you. Again, just write it down, keep it for a reference. All right, so let's uh, play around with these formulas. So going back to our example, if we don't have, um, if we're just going to use technology to find the sample mean and sample variance or standard deviation either way, um, here's the summary statistics for our sample. And I uh, created this in StatCrunch if you're curious. You could use Excel or a calculator. Uh, the sample mean for the first group is about 7.9. The sample variance is 1.03, and I did use variance here. Um, I could have used standard deviation and then squared it. Either way, it will work. Um, sample size was 14. For the second sample, the sample mean was 8.4. The variance was 1.01. .01. And again, the sample size was 14. Being that both of our samples are the same size, we can use that first row where we saw the, let me go back for a moment. If we look at the test statistic formulas, since our sample sizes are the same, we can use this uh, test statistic formula, which is the same whether or not the population has equal variance. So that doesn't, that assumption doesn't even matter to us right now. Okay, so we're gonna plug these values into that correct formula which is this formula. Um, the degrees of freedom is just going to be 2n minus 2, so 2 times 14 is 28 minus 2, 26 degrees of freedom. We'll need this later when we try to find our critical value. So plugging these in, um, notice here the d naught, the difference under HO is 0. I plugged in 0 over here. Other than that, I just plugged in the other numbers I have up here into the formula, and I got that my test statistic is negative 1.4368. Now let's uh, find the critical value. So again, we're going to pull up the t-table. Our degrees of freedom was 2n minus 2. So that would be 28 minus 2 is uh, 26. So we're going to go down the 26 row. Our alpha value was uh, 0.05. So divide that by 2, and you get 0.025. And we're dividing it by 2 because it's a two-tailed test. So that gives us a test statistic of 2.056. And because the two-tailed test, it could be on the positive side or the negative side because we're testing both tails. So we're going to reject HO if our test statistic is bigger than um, our 2.056 or less than the negative 2.056. So our test statistic was negative, but it wasn't less than the negative test statistic, uh, negative critical value. As a result, our test statistic doesn't fall in the rejection region, so we'd have to fail to reject HO. Repeating this example, but using, um, I use StatCrunch here to create this table, but any statistical software would create very similar tables. Notice here that I used pool variances, but I didn't need to. Even if I didn't use pool variances, I would have gotten the same results as we saw. Um, I made sure to select in the software that the differences should be zero or not equal to zero under HA. And all I need to do is look now is at the p-value. The p-value in the printout is 0.1627. Remember our alpha value was 5%. So since alpha is less than our p-value, we failed to reject HO. So same conclusion as before. This means at a 5% significance level, there is insufficient evidence that the true mean uh, red blood cell mass of flight animals differs from non-flight animals. If we want to do a confidence interval for the difference in um, the difference of two means, it's the same formula as we saw before. It's going to be our sample estimate of the difference plus or minus a margin of error. The margin of error, um, if we have a large sample, um, will be our critical value of z times the standard error, and this is the sta same standard error formula that we saw in the previous slides. And again, if we have a small sample, we'll use t. We need to assume the populations are normal. 
Um, and if our population variances are the same, we need to have a pooled estimate of variance. Okay, so let's just plug in our sample statistics from before to do a confidence interval for our previous example. Degrees of freedom are the same. And if our confidence level is 95%, our alpha would still be 5%. Our alpha divided by 2 would still be 0.025. So we have the same number from the t-table we had before, the 2.056, because a two-tailed test is really the same thing as a confidence interval in terms of the test statistic. Plug the numbers into a formula, and we get 0.0786 as our margin of error. So we added and subtracted from our difference in two means, which was negative 0.549. And we get our confidence interval of negative 1.335 to 0.237. Notice that this confidence interval contains both negative and positive numbers. This means zero is contained in this interval. So that means the difference could be negative or positive. So there's no, ev no statistical evidence of a difference between these two means. It's not a statistically different means. So uh, phrasing this interval in words, we are 95% confident that the mean difference between the red blood cell mass of rats that have been to space and rats that have not falls between negative 1.335 milliliters and 0.237 milliliters. Okay, just doing one more example here. Uh, what if we have different sample sizes and a pooled variance, so just we'll use a different test statistic formula. Uh, two ice cream companies, and this is a made up example, brand one and brand two, produce one gallon cartons of ice cream. Both brands use similar machines, so would they have the same standard deviation to fill their cartons? But they could set the average amount in each carton to different amounts. You want to determine if one brand is a better buy in other words, which brand has a statistically higher average volume at an alpha of point, uh, sorry, at an alpha of 0.05 or 5%. Um, brand one has a sample average of 1.16 gallons, a standard deviation of 0.06 gallons, and we sampled 10 cartons. The second brand has a uh, sample average of 1.09 gallons, a standard deviation of 0.07 gallons, and we sampled, and this is out of a sample of 12 ice cream cartons. So are these means statistically different? Now, that wasn't 100% the question. Even though we want to know, is there a statistical difference, we also want to know which brand has a higher weight. So a confidence interval might be a better approach here, because not only will it tell us if there's a statistically, um, if there's a statistical difference, it also tells us which one is bigger. If the difference is positive, if both numbers in the confidence interval are positive, that means brand one is bigger than brand two. If both numbers are negative, that means brand two should be bigger than brand one. So let's do the confidence interval. Let's use the confidence interval to approach this question. Um, our confidence interval formula is the same as before. It's uh, the difference in the sample means plus or minus the margin of error. The margin of error formula, however, is gonna be a little bit different. We're gonna pool the variances, because that the problem told us that they're used, the two companies are using the same machine, so their variances should be the same, but the sample sizes are different. So this is the formula we're gonna use. We are gonna have a pooled variance measure here. And the formula to pool the variances is essentially a weighted average of the variances based on degrees of freedom. So let's plug those numbers into the formula the degrees of freedom for our whole sample, by the way, is just going to be n1 plus n2 minus 2, which is the same as the denominator for our pooled, um, our pooled variance. Bringing up the test statistics, I'm uh, not test statistics, the uh, sample uh, summary statistics. Let's calculate this. So plugging the numbers into our um, uh, let's find the pooled variance first, right? We already know the sample sizes. We can look up the T alpha over two on a table. So let's start off by trying to find the pooled variances. Plugging our summary statistics into the formula, we get a pooled variance of 
uh, plugging in our sample sizes and our pooled variance into our margin of error formula, we get that the margin of error will be whatever our t is times 0.028126. So let's find the critical value, t alpha over 2, keeping in mind that we wanted to do a 95% confidence interval, which means our alpha is 5%, and our alpha over 2 would be then half that, 0 0.025. Our degrees of freedom was found to be 20, because it's the first sample, which size, which is 10, second one is 12, that's 22, subtract 2, gives you 20. So we go down the 20th row, the 0 0.025 column, and our uh, critical value is 2.086. Plugging this into the margin of error formula gives us a margin of error of approximately 0.06. So finishing this off, the difference in our sample means is 0.07. So therefore our confidence interval is going to be 0.07 gallons plus or minus 0.06 gallons. So we're 95% confident that the mean difference is somewhere between 0.01 gallons and 0.13 gallons. Phrasing this a little bit more clearly, we are 95% confident that the true difference in the average volume of ice cream cartons between brand one and brand two is between 0.01 gallons and 0.13 gallons. In other words, we are 95% confident that on average brand one's cartons contain between 0.01 to 0.03 uh, 0.13 gallons more of uh, more ice cream than brand two. Quick note on the conditions for valid inferences for independent samples. Um, as far as our sampling condition, the two samples have to be sampled randomly um, in an independent manner from the two target populations. Again, it doesn't truly have to be random. It just has to be done in a non-biased way, but they do have to be done independently. So there can't be any connection between the two different groups, um, person by person. We also need to make some assumptions about the population if the sample sizes are small. Both populations have to be normally distributed. Um, if they're not, you can use the Wilcoxon rank sum test, which is, of course, beyond the scope of the class, but it is in your textbook if you're curious. Um, we also need the population variances to be equal. Um, and if they're not, um, well, <laughs> If, if they are equal, you should use the pooled variance. If they're not equal, just make sure not to pull the variances. Don't use the pooled variance formula. Um, for large samples, um, where both samples are at least 30, you don't need any assumptions about the population because the central limit theorem applies. And the sample standard deviation will be a good approximation for the population standard deviations of each group. So you can use the Z statistic without any issues.